Hi there, my name is Chris Harris and I'm from AlloyTutors.com and welcome to this video on Group 2 Elements, Chemical Properties and Products. In this video, we're going to be looking at how Group 2 metals react with water, oxygen and chlorine. We're also going to look at the solubility of Group 2 uh, compounds, so for example, sulfates, carbonates and hydroxides. Uh, we're also going to look at how these compounds act as bases and finally then come on to the uses of some of these group two compounds as well. Okay, so we're gonna start with the reactions with water. So like group one metals, uh, group two metals can react with water. And as we go down the group, they become more vigorous in terms of their reactions, just like group one metals. In fact, uh, at the top of the group, beryllium doesn't even react with water. Uh, when we go down the group, barium is really reactive with water. Although group two metals are not as reactive as their group one counterparts. So we're going to start with looking at the reactions of these because these are really important. You do need to know these. So barium uh, is an example we're going to use. So we react that with water and we form barium hydroxide plus hydrogen. This is the same as group one metals as well, except it's just a, a group one metal instead of a group two metal. Uh, but we form a hydroxide. Hydroxides are alkaline, and group two metals are also known as alkaline earth metals, and the alkaline bit from that uh, is basically because they form alkaline compounds when dissolved into water. Um, now, and also notice you've got the brackets and a two outside. A hydroxide ion has a one minus charge, and so therefore you need two OH minuses to balance out the barium two plus ion charge on there. So it's really important that you make sure you put that in brackets uh, and then you put a little two next to it as well. Uh, if it was a group one metal, then it would just be group one metal with one OH next to it. So make sure you put the brackets around with the two. Hydrogen gas is given off and a way in which you can test for that is by uh, putting a splint, a lighted splint next to it uh, and you should get a squeaky pop produced because of the hydrogen. And um, there is a slight exception actually, uh, is magnesium. And actually, if we take magnesium solid and we react that with water, so just like cold water, you would form a small amount of barium hydroxide and hydrogen. Magnesium is very unreactive. It's near the top of group two, so it doesn't really react very much, if at all. It's really slow reaction with water. However, if we take the water and we boil it, in other words, turn it to steam, we get a different product. We actually get an oxide instead of a hydroxide. So we take magnesium solid and react it with water and we put the G next to it to show that it's a gas, uh, steam. We do produce hydrogen as well, uh, but we do produce an oxide. You've got to remember that. Make sure you don't uh, forget that one. Uh, really look carefully at your state symbols. Is the water steam or is it a liquid like the one above? Okay, um, we're going to look at the reactions with oxygen uh, and the um, metals will react with oxygen to form an oxide, which is pretty straightforward. Um, so you can see here we've got beryllium. Uh, which is a uh, solid, and we're going to react that with oxygen, so it's just combustion, you would form beryllium oxide. Notice it's BeO, uh, oxygen is O2 minus, and beryllium is 2 plus. So let's look at the oxidation states of these then. Um, so we're going to show, you can see here that beryllium actually has an oxidation state of zero. All elements have an oxidation state of zero. Uh, but over here, beryllium actually has a plus two charge because now it's bonded with oxygen. So you can see here that actually the beryllium, because the oxidation number has increased, uh, it shows oxida an oxidation process. So um, the beryllium has gone to Be2 plus as part of a compound. Uh, and if we look at the other one, which is oxygen, uh, again, O2 is zero because it's an element. So, uh, and then over here, it's minus two. So the oxygen has been reduced in this reaction here. So that's really, really important. Okay, uh, same again with chlorine, it's a really easy reaction. You take a group two metal, again, we've taken beryllium again, beryllium uh, is a solid. Uh, we'll react that with chlorine gas uh, and you'll form beryllium chloride. Again, if we look at our oxidation states, it's, it's pretty much the same as it is for oxygen. So beryllium is zero oxidation state there. Uh, and then over here it is plus two. So the beryllium has been oxidized in this reaction because the oxidation state has gone up. Um, and the chlorine in this case, which is zero here because again, it's an element, is now individually, it is minus one over here. Um, but because we have two of them, it effectively forms a minus two in total to make sure that it balances. But again, either way, the chlorine has been reduced 
uh, from 0 to minus 1. So it is important that you're able to uh, spot uh, oxidation and reduction in these reactions as well. Okay, so let's look at the solubility of some of these compounds. Now you can see here that we've got sulfates, carbonates and hydroxides. These are the ones that we need to be concerned with. Uh, and actually the ones with the double charges, the two minus charges, are actually more soluble as we go up the group. Or in other words, you could say that they become less soluble as we go down the group. So uh, barium sulfate and barium carbonate, you can see the purple line here represents sulfates. The green line represents carbonate. So at the bottom, these are the least soluble ones. Uh, whereas the singly charged ones, which is OH, is the opposite way around. So these become more soluble as we go down the group. So barium hydroxide is very soluble in water, whereas beryllium hydroxide is uh, insoluble in water. So um, you do need to know these as well. It's really, really important. And one of the ways is you can remember double charge uh, becomes less soluble as we go down the group. A single charge becomes more soluble as we go down group two. Um, a good way as well is we can use these solubility rules to actually test for uh, certain groups, um, in particular negative ions. So, for example, we can test an unknown compound to see if it contains sulfate ions by adding barium chloride into the solution. And if sulfate, if sulfate ions exist, then we should get a precipitate formed because you will form barium sulfate uh, if we react it with barium chloride. So barium sulfate, we know is insoluble, so you should get a precipitate that forms. So there's a neat little way in which we can use solubility of group two compounds to actually test for certain groups as well. Um, and we can also test for things like carbonates as well. Uh, again, um, a carbonate, you can add an acid to it uh, and you would produce carbon dioxide gas. You'll see gas is given off, uh, but you can make sure that that is carbon dioxide by bubbling that through lime water. And if the lime water turns cloudy, then you know that you've got a carbonate ion in your unknown solution. So we'll come on to that later, actually, because they can act as bases. OK, so um, let's come on to this bit. So we're looking at these group two compounds uh, reacting as a base. Uh, and it's pretty much the same as any other uh, base, really. So, for example, we've got magnesium oxide. Remember, oxides and hydroxides and carbonates are all classed as bases. So magnesium oxide uh, can react with water. Uh, and effectively what we get is two ions that are produced. So this is when we dissolve these things. We get an Mg2 plus and OH minus ions. And so remember, uh, for something to be alkaline or something to be a base, it needs to have hydroxide ions present. And this is why it works, because the ion actually splits up. These are ionic compounds. So um, I'm just going to underline uh, that bit there. So that's what you're looking for, is hydroxide ions. And this is why they act as bases. So if we take magnesium oxide and react it with an acid, we always form salt plus water. Uh, and the salt is a classic sign uh, of a neutralization reaction. So um, any acid plus base will give salt plus water. And uh, we can do the same for hydroxides as well. Hydroxides, again, are just acid plus base. Uh, we form our salt, magnesium chloride plus water. So it's the same uh, principle that's really important. Um, the other thing as well, like I say, is the one with carbonates. Um, if we take an acid plus a metal carbonate, group two metal carbonate, uh, we will also form uh, a salt plus water, but we will crucially form carbon dioxide. And like I say, we can take that gas, bubble it through lime water. If it turns it cloudy, then we know we formed uh, carbon dioxide gas. OK, and just coming to the final thing is the uses of uh, some of these group two compounds, because they actually have been used for years and years, um, hundreds of years. So um, calcium hydroxide is the first one, and it's used to neutralize acidic soils. Very useful if you want to try and grow crops uh, that uh, can't survive or don't grow very well in acidic soils and need more alkaline soils um, or neutral soils. So that's very useful in the agricultural industry. Uh, also used is uh, magnesium hydroxide. It's used for indigestion, um, in particular milk of magnesia. And you may have seen this in uh, pharmacies and supermarkets. Uh, it comes in um, a bottle and it'll look like, literally looks like milk. Uh, it's a white liquid uh, that you can drink um, and it helps to take that pain away after you've eaten a lot of food um, or spicy food, should we say. And barium sulfate is the uh, other compound as well. And we can use that for barium meal. 
Um, and this is really useful because actually um, if you've got um, indigestion problems or well just any type of digestive system problem um, it's really difficult to diagnose it without actually having an external screen so what they do is they give you a little tablet and it contains barium sulfate in there you swallow it down uh, into your uh, intestinal tract leave it for about 20 minutes or so and then you go and stand in front of an x-ray machine uh, and effectively wherever the barium sulfate is uh, it should uh, obviously dissolve within the gut uh, and it will show up on the x-ray. The reason why is because barium sulfate is a really dense material. It absorbs x-rays unlike the normal fleshy uh, intestines which aren't shown on a normal x-ray. So really useful and can show blockages etc. So very very useful as well. The problem is though barium itself uh, is actually toxic, really toxic. Um, so you might think, well, why do we take it then if it's so toxic? But the key thing is, we come back to solubility again. Barium sulfate, if you can remember, is actually insoluble. So thankfully, it won't dissolve into your bloodstream and will just stay in your gut, So, um, which is obviously very, very useful. So a very common exam question for them to ask is they say it's it's toxic. So why, isn't it, um, why doesn't it kill you? And that's because it's insoluble, so it won't dissolve into the bloodstream. Thank God for that. Okay, and the last bit... Uh, is magnesium sulfate uh, and this is used as a mild laxative in crystal form uh, and when we're talking about crystals these are basically just solids with um, seven waters surrounding them so it's a hydrated salt uh, and we call them Epsom salts and it was discovered in a, a small town in Surrey in England uh, called Epsom where they took the mineral water from there and they separated the salt from the uh, water uh, and effectively called it Epsom salt. Uh, and it was taken to, like I say, help you uh, go to the toilet when you get a little bit bunged up. So a lot of these uh, uh, group two compounds, obviously uh, you see there's a bit of a, a trend to do with the intestines here, but um, so very useful for medicinal uses, but also for agriculture as well, just at the top there. But that's it, hope that helps, bye-bye.